Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello, <laughs> Loretta. How are you? Welcome. Hi. Okay. Nice to be here. Yes, this is fantastic. So welcome, everybody. Today's topic is fantastic. Actually, this is a bonus to two amazing days that we had a couple of weeks ago, focus on belonging and loneliness. But actually one of those topics that we didn't cover in depth was the chemistry of the brain and how these uh, chemicals that um, our body and our brain and uh, generate actually have a major impact in our attitude, in who we are, and I always love uh, to learn from Loretta about the way we can be in peace with our inner mammal. <laughs> because Loretta uh, Brunin, and thank you so much for joining, is the, is the founder of the Inner Mammal Institute, a Merita professor, a, and now actually a member, advisory board member of the World Happiness Foundation. We are so happy to have you here. So today's topic is gonna be it's an amazing webinar. We are, going, we are going to go in depth about this topic that is not easy. Actually, it's something that we learned during those two days, looking at belonging and, 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 and belonging with loneliness in many ways uh, from so many different angles is that the topic is super, super deep. And it looks like it's necessary, of course, for society and humans to evolve and flourish but it's not easy to manage. So having you, Loretta, and giving us some uh, wisdom and understanding is gonna be fantastic. So thank you so much for joining. And um, we are gonna go in depth. We have about 45 minutes, a uh, long 45 minutes. Uh, we are on uh, live uh, on the World Happiness Academy as well as uh, streaming. So please ask your questions. I'll be collecting them and I'll be asking some of them to Loretta when she finished this presentation. But with that, Loretta, thank you so much for joining. And uh, let's, let's Hi. see. Great, let's see thanks for happening. having me. Thanks for organizing this. And thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, this topic is fascinating to me. I was so excited when I discovered it after having studied psychology for my whole adult life. Uh, the research on animals really helped me understand myself and my automatic responses and to redirect those responses. And that's the whole goal of my work is first to be honest about our inner mammal and then second to understand our power to redirect it individually in our own heads. So I'm um, going to do my screen share. Um, always takes me a minute. And then play. Great, good. So um, we've all seen lots of cute heart heartwarming pictures of animals. And we know that most mammals live in a herd or pack or troop. And it's easy to have sort of romanticized feelings about these images that we see, but we're going to go into the reality behind it and then the brain that creates that reality. Um, all of this is a lot in a lot more detail in all of my books, but I'm gonna go a little bit quickly today. We tend to idealize the social bonds of animals and it's easy to project onto them that they're, they're all warm and fuzzy and nice to each other. But the reality we know is that animals have a lot of conflict in their groups. And there was a whole century of research on this conflict and now it's sort of gone out of style but you can still see it in um, wildlife videos. So animals stick with their groups despite the conflict. <clears throat> because it gives them protection from predators. So the animal brain evolved to seek safety in numbers. And <clears throat> when you look at a picture of an animal herd, you may think it's that nice one for all and all for one feeling. But the reality is that animals push their way to the center of the herd where it's safer. And you can see this a little bit here. Um, I was a docent at the Oakland Zoo and in my docent training, I even learned about this natural impulse to push to the center where it's safer. When, there's no, when there are no predators, animals spread out. 
they look for greener pasture and it's, in, it's easier to meet your needs when you wander off to greener pasture than when you're pushing in a herd. So it's easy to see how we humans do the same. You could sort of observe that in daily life. And we're gonna talk about how our brains and our brain chemistry produce this response and how we can redirect it when we need to. So we all like our independence, but when we feel threatened, we look for the safety of social support. So we want both. We want that independence, but we want that safety of social support. And both are natural. So self-acceptance is a big part of making peace with your inner mammal. So mammals forget their differences and unite when they face a common enemy. When a lion approaches a troop of baboons, they may have been fighting all day, but they unite and they fight off that baboon. And evolutionary biology has taught us about that very well. Now, in the groups you belong to, you can hear the same thing. People talk about common enemies, and it's a fun exercise. You can spend your day, notice with every time you talk to other people, how they bring the focus to the common enemies of whoever is in the room. <laughs> Unfortunately, we all know that there are consequences, uh, a lot of human squabbling in one way or another and maybe some squab squabbling gets your attention, but it's good to notice even the squabbling among people you like. Biology can help us understand these impulses and find a better way. We're gonna talk about why our brain urgently seeks the good feeling of belonging, why it's hard to get that, and what would be some new ways to get it. First, why our brain urgently seeks the good feeling of belonging. We know an isolated mammal is quickly killed by predators. So natural selection builds a brain that rewards you with the good feeling of oxytocin when you find social support. So you look for social support, oxytocin is released and you relax and that's like, oh, that feels good. So you want that, but it's not the only thing you want because we have other happy chemicals, dopamine, serotonin, we want them too. So from a human perspective, that's why we have this conflict because we want one happy chemical, but we want the others and our brain evolved to focus on the unmet need. So when you have social support, you take it for granted and you get frustrated about what you don't have. But when you trot off to greener pasture and you're finding what you want, but then you feel isolated and your oxytocin falls. And so that's why we have such a conflict. Oxytocin motivates us to find social support by making it feel good. When you leave the herd, your oxytocin falls and you feel threatened. And it's easy to see why that works in the animal world because when an animal left the group, they could be killed in a split second. So nature needed sort of a warning bell, but instead of just warning you with terror, it warns you by letting the good feeling drop. So we want to go back to whatever reactivates the good feeling of having social support or safety in numbers. Now in your human verbal brain, you don't think of it as safety in numbers, but it's really the same thing. The threatened feeling motivates you to do what it takes to stimulate oxytocin. And here I have a picture of some young people and you may remember your younger years when you felt threatened and you were so motivated to do what it takes to stimulate oxytocin, to have social support. Every one of us goes through those years and I was so fascinated to learn how it works with monkeys. Monkeys leave the groups they're born into and join a new group and they feel threatened when they do that. And they can't relax until they gain acceptance in a new group. So we've inherited a brain that's designed to um, make us constantly um, seek that group. Oxytocin creates the sense that it's safe to lower your guard. So this is what you're really feeling. When you have social support, I can lower my guard because if there's danger, the rest of the herd will alert me. And that's what allows a herd animal to relax enough to eat rather than constantly be, being 
on high alert for predators. So that's what we want is to share the burden of, of vulnerability, to share the burden of um, potential threat, the burden of vigilance, I call it. So we all have a certain sense of vigilance. And when you're with the herd, you think, oh, if other people are not worried, then I won't worry. But you know that that's sort of a bad bargain because then when other people worry, then you feel like you have to worry. So all of this is quite complex. So oxytocin feels so good that we constantly seek more, which is why it's interesting that it's often called the love molecule or the bonding hormone. And um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the um, romantic part of it because the romantic part of it, as important as it is, is a lot of oxytocin at once and then it falls. And so then you're left with nothing after, you know, if your lover leaves in the morning to quote some famous movies. So then what? So that's why we look for more long-term uh, protection of the group, of and other uh, individuals that we're attached to. So um, attachment is what makes us mammals and there are many ways to seek it. And the more we understand the impulse, the better we can recognize what we're doing to get oxytocin and then add new tools so that we um, get it easily, more easily. And important is to why it's hard. So we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, we'll get to it right now. Why is it hard to get? Our brain is not designed to release oxytocin all the time. This is the frustrating part. You think maybe you're supposed to just get it and some people say, oh, my oxytocin is low. And the truth is everybody's oxytocin is low until they do something to stimulate it. And then in a short time, it's metabolized and then it's gone. And then you have to do something to stimulate it again. That is how our brain is designed to work. We don't have it all the time because that would not promote survival. Because if you had oxytocin all the time, you would lower your guard when you should not. And the cliche where I grew up in New York is you would buy the Brooklyn Bridge from a stranger. You would, you would give a stranger your money. You would, you, would do, you would trust people who you shouldn't trust if your oxytocin flowed all the time. So instead, the mammal brain evolved to make careful decisions about when to release the oxytocin. So we could be grateful for our mammalian inheritance that's designed to help us make good decisions about oxytocin and not to just believe that everybody else is having it all the time and something is wrong with me for not having it all the time. Of course, the big question is, so how does your mammal brain decide when to release it? The, your verbal brain doesn't control the chemicals the way you might think. So you may think this is when I should trust and this is when I should not trust. But that's not exactly how your mammal brain is doing it, but it's not reporting to you what it's doing. So let's take a closer look. Neurons connect when oxytocin flows and that wires you to turn it on more easily in similar circumstances. So whatever triggered your oxytocin when you were young, connected neurons, and today when you see something similar, that gives you that feeling of social trust that you're looking for. So each brain is eager to repeat behaviors that triggered the good feeling in the past and it could be a wide variety of experiences and especially early experience because that's when our neuroplasticity is high. The famous example is uh, Marcel Proust's Madeleine cookies. He said that as the instant he walked into this bakery, the smell of the cookies triggered the memory of when he was a child and his nurse bought him um, that cookie and he felt the safety and the protection of that moment through the smell of the cookie. And there are so many other examples of, you know, going smelling mama's cooking, unless you have a bad association for mama's cooking, in which case, then it's something else. But we all have our individual oxytocin circuits built from past experience. 
Oxytocin is released in short spurts that are quickly metabolized. This is the complication of life. And if you watch nature videos, especially those of David Attenborough, and my website has more information um, under my um, reading list on my website, um, oxytocin, all of the happy chemicals, you only get a little bit of it in the right situation. That's supposed to motivate action, a step toward survival. When, once you take that survival step, so the moment is over, the chemical stops, it's gone, and then you have to take another survival action to stimulate more, which is why we all have to keep doing things to trigger it. And, you know, I'll just give you an example, like of we talked about the uh, Marcel Proust's cookies. This um, cup of coffee has a fond memory for me. Um, it was the first time that I ever saw latte art. Like I, now everybody has hearts on their latte, on their cappuccino, but um, this was the first time many years ago that I saw it and I took a picture, it was so exciting. It's probably the first time I had a phone that could take a picture. So um, for me, that triggers a sense of discovery, which is dopamine, but I'm also grateful to my husband for going on these adventures with me. So that's the oxytocin part. So I can go to dangerous greener pasture without being alone because my husband is willing to go with me. So this is an example of how we're all looking for all the chemicals all the time, but no one actually has them. They're just there to motivate the action. You may have heard that touch triggers oxytocin. This is the simplistic understanding that's uh, popular in the media now, um, but it is more complicated. Um, animals, we often hear about how they touch each other. And of course, mother mammals cuddle their babies. And if they don't have arms, they lick their babies. So touch does stimulate oxytocin. And it works from birth, which is why our oxytocin, our oxytocin circuits start building at birth and why we have attachment from birth that reptiles don't have. And again, that's what makes us mammals. But it gets complicated because you can't stay with mama your whole life. And in nature, mama kicks you out at a pretty young age. You have to build new social bonds. And that is the challenge of being mammal building new bonds that are reliable, yet with the freedom that modern humans want because most people have the choice. Do I want to follow the herd every minute or not? And modern humans have mostly decided not to follow the herd every minute. And that choice is what makes our life difficult. And instead of grieving it, we can celebrate it because Nobody's stopping you from following the herd, but we've made our choices. In the state of nature, anyone close enough to touch you is close enough to kill you. This is why the brain evolved to make careful decisions about oxytocin. So monkeys don't let just anyone groom them because if you let someone groom you that you don't know or that you don't trust, they can hurt you and they do. Watch those nature videos. So how do I know who to trust? That's half of the equation. The other half of the equation is, if I groom your fur, will you groom my fur? And if you don't groom my fur, well, maybe you'll owe me a favor and you'll do me a favor another day. So all of these calculations may sound a bit crass to your verbal brain, but your verbal brain does not have insider information about what your mammal brain is doing. And in fact, this is what your mammal brain is doing as we know from any textbook on evolutionary biology. And again, I do have a reading list and all of my books explain this in detail. You don't let someone close unless your oxytocin, your oxytocin turns on to tell you it's safe. Now, what does it mean to let someone close? Well. For most of human history, you did not leave your village because if you left your village, strangers would kill you. But today we have the luxury that before, before the pandemic, I could get on a, tr a plane and go to the other side of the world 
and just walk down the street alone and be safe. This is a miracle. This is something we should be so grateful for. And this has taken a lot of uh, centuries of rule of law to build this. Um, so the reason people feel so conflicted is because they've raised the bar, like walking down the street and people not killing you is not enough. They somehow feel that they want to trust people in deeper ways. And um, I talk in my books about like there's childlike trust, but you can't expect childlike trust in the adult world. Um, I have my um, best oxytocin moment of my life, I have to tell you. I went to China. I was actually alone. I love their massages. So here I was alone on the other side of the world without a common language because I just walked into a place where English wasn't spoken, whipped out my credit card and took off my clothes in you know a little booth and waited for my massage therapist. So imagine the level of trust that you can safely give your credit card and take your clothes off alone. So we have such a great level of trust in the world. And I really wanna emphasize that because all, only the negative gets attention in the media. So trust comes before touch. So you don't let someone trust you, uh, excuse me, you don't let someone touch you until you trust them. You don't let someone touch you until you trust them but we all define it in our own ways. How do you decide who you trust? If someone has Hollywood good looks, is that enough to trust them? I don't think so, but when you're a teenager, you know, um, well, anyway, our brain is constantly making that decision. Hugging someone you don't trust does not feel good. This is so important because the media is telling you that the way to stimulate oxytocin is to hug people. And if you've been doing that, you may feel like it's not working and this is why. So happy to talk about that more, but we do need to move on to other subjects. So trust is what the mammal brain is really looking for. We define trust with oxytocin pathways built from past experience, which is indeed complex. When your trust is betrayed, your cortisol surges because the threat is so close. So this is the complication of life. It's like, you're a little kid, you wanna trust everyone, but you could get kidnapped. <laughs> so you do need to be careful about who you trust. So how do you decide? Cortisol, which is often called the stress chemical, whenever you have a bad feeling about someone, cortisol is released and neurons connect and that turns on the bad feeling in the future. Now, some uh, uh, children learn some of this, from others who tell them when to have a bad feeling. And we all know the complications of that, but I don't wanna just point to others. I know that everyone likes to find fault with other people's in-group, out-group behavior and not look at their own. So I'm, if I did that, I'd be just doing the same thing. You know, I could spend the whole hour pointing at the evil common enemy and we can all feel good about pointing at the common enemy and we're the good guys and they're the bad guys, but then we wouldn't understand our inner mammal. So that is our goal. So when was my trust betrayed in my early years? Everyone can ask themselves. I trusted, I was disappointed, my cortisol search, I built a pathway and that makes it harder for me to trust in that specific situation. So a simple example would be, I thought I would get a promotion, I didn't get the promotion, my cortisol surged, and now whenever I'm in a similar situation, I expect something bad. That wires you not to trust in similar situations. Each brain expects conflict or rejection where they found it before. Now the conflict or rejection, and, and we all have both, of your youth is what built the biggest pathways in your brain again, all explained in my books. Um, so we all expect conflict and rejection where we had it in our past. And this is why we'll soon move on to how we can build new pathways to um, 
stop obstructing ourselves in our own quest for oxytocin. Each brain seeks belonging in ways that worked before. Um, very quickly, in the interest of time, I just want to tell you a little about horses. When you see a group of horses, again, it's easy to romanticize and project these warm and fuzzy feelings on horses. Um, what is interesting now that is often reported, horses, so mammals are sort of hierarchical, but in horses, they don't have um, uh, the kind of uh, vertical hierarchy. So the top horse is in the center. The lead horse is in the center. And why is the lead horse in the center? Is not because he's dominating like a chimp, is because he has the most confidence. So all the others are mirroring him. All the others are following him. So if he stumbles and he has a moment of like, gee, I don't know what to do, then another horse knows what to do. When he starts going, the others might then temporarily follow him. So it's easy to think about ourselves. It's like, when I'm stuck, I make a decision. Who do I want to follow? Who seems to have confidence in this situation? And fortunately in the modern world, I can shift my focus. So I don't have to follow the same individual all the time in a cult-like fashion, but I can always be deciding um, uh, and also to some extent mirroring because our mirror neurons are uh, triggering some of that impulse to just conform. And I know, again, it's easy to point fingers at others, but it's important to see that in oneself. So we all see the world through the lens of past experience. And that's why it's not easy being a mammal. And it's so useful when we understand these impulses. Our verbal brain doesn't understand them automatically, but with effort, we can train our verbal brain so that our two brains work together like the rider and the elephant or the rider and the horse. We have two brains because we need both. We should not think of one as the good guy and one as the bad guy, but they have to work together. But often <laughs> you may feel this way. So you feel like anything I do can go bad because our cortisol builds such big pathways. We turn it on so easily and even though we're on our way to happy chemicals, we see everything that can go wrong. So um, most of my books are about happy chemicals with a little bit of um, unhappy, but then I have one book that's mostly on the unhappy chemicals with a little bit of happy. So you can um, check it out. So let's talk about new oxytocin strategies. So here are three short, simple ways to stimulate oxytocin, even in lockdown. That's um, something we can bring to us and hopefully even use this time well to do it even more today. First, build one-to-one -one trust skills. Second, small steps repeated. And third, realistic expectations. So let's look at these in more detail. So these are all pandemic approved, but um, also going out into the world approved both. So whichever you get to choose. I'm choosing by going to Florida in a few weeks. So I'm just mentioning that in case any of you are in Florida, I'd love to hear from you. Um, first, build one-to-one -one trust skills. Now I need to tell you the real life story behind this photo. <laughs> um, again, this photo looks so warm and fuzzy and heartwarming that everyone says, oh, why can't humans be like that? But Animals do not have this warm and fuzzy life that you're thinking. So here's how this photo came to be. It's a very sad and happy and sad story, but it's true. So when I was a, a zoo docent, this, um, the, so this species, it's a um, uh, white-handed gibbon, it's actually called from South China, Northern Vietnam, Thailand has a lot of them. So they come in both colors, it's random, um, just like blonde hair, um, black hair. So um, they are a monogamous ape and there are very few monogamous apes, but uh, 
they're not 100% monogamous, but paternity tests suggest they're about 66% monogamous. <laughs> um, so this, um, the darker one is the male, his partner died and we were so sad. So our zoo applied for a new partner for him, but took two years to get one. And we all, us zoo docents were so sad waiting. And finally, one day they got him a new partner. We called her the young blonde <laughs> because she was literally a young blonde. So she, she climbs in to the enclosure she immediately, they immediately embrace like this. Everybody took pictures and that was it. They never embraced again. So we all looked, let me tell you. So in a way, it seems like they established trust. They built the circuit. Okay, that's it. Now, now we're, we're engaged. <laughs> um, so that's just, I, I just have to tell you the, the real life truth. But... The reality in human life is we want this feeling, how can we get it? So there's the idealized notion of monogamy, but we all know that once you have that feeling and you create that bond, that the feeling doesn't last forever. So I deal with that in chapter one of my book. So let's just move on with that because we've all moved on with that. So we want more trust. Um, and again, just not to blame monogamy, our brain looks for new and improved. That's the dopamine part of our internal motivator. So once you have one trust bond, you get excited about building new trust bonds. And again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting having an affair either. I should manage that. Uh, I should mention that, but the idea is to have um, trust bonds that meet your unmet needs. That's why you want to have some at work and some in your entertainment life and some at home. And then when you feel that sense of enemy, which your mammal brain will do, then you want to have people who ally with you against common enemies. So you build, if you build trust with individuals, you're less dependent on the herd for your oxytocin. So here's a simple example. Imagine you're a teenager and teenagers want that sense of social support. So they may join a group and they want to be in that group with a sense of life or death urgency. When they're not with the group, their oxytocin falls, their cortisol rises, they feel like their survival is threatened and they're gonna do whatever that group does. But let's say, what if the group does something bad and you don't want to go along with the group? The modern term for this is peer pressure, but whatever you call it, the idea is many people, especially young people, follow the group even when the group does something they don't agree with because they fear that a predator will eat them immediately when they're alone. Of course, no one thinks that with their verbal brain, but that's the feeling. But if you have alternate forms of social support that frees you from having to follow the group every minute. So if you build bridges toward individuals, then you have a choice and you can get your feeling of oxytocin, your feeling of social support and one minute with this person and another minute with that person. Now, we still have the complex reality that excuse me, the group may, may not like you if you refuse to follow the group. If the group feels like we are all getting together to fight the predator and you are not doing your share to help us fight the enemy, so then they don't want you. So I acknowledge this is a complex, difficult choice that each of us has to make. Um, how much do we follow the group and how much do we go our independent way. And I'm suggesting that the more individual bonds you build, the more you feel safe and give yourself choice so that you don't have this life or death feeling that I must either stick with the herd or feel like um, my survival is threatened. Again, with our verbal brain, we don't say that our survival is threatened, 
but it's that loneliness that is caused by that um, cortisol. That's why loneliness feels so bad. So this is hard, which is why herd following is popular. But it's a skill everyone can learn with practice. And once again, my books uh, explain it, not just my books, I have lots of free resources on my website, lots of free resources. And also I'm happy to talk with anyone, um, but it's a skill that everyone can learn with practice to um, confidence in your own trust building skills allows you to take independent steps without feeling like your survival is threatened. Now let's talk about small steps repeated. Most of us have heard this. It's a method often called the Kaizen method, but it, it's um, how um, a little bit of oxytocin can not only feel good today, but why are you to feel good more easily tomorrow? Small acts of trust stimulate oxytocin. And uh, I should, again, with these pictures, I use these pictures for entertainment purposes, but the reality is that chimps do not um, have the kind of facial expression and eye contact that humans do. And often a smile is a, um, a threat. Um, often a smile is fear. So I'm really um, just using this uh, full disclosure um, because it's cute. <laughs> so how can you make a small act of trust to stimulate oxytocin? The idea is that um, if you have someone that you want to build trust with, don't go out and buy them a new car because, you know, why are they going to say, what, why are you buying me a new car? That, you know, you want something from me. So it's small acts of trust with repetition builds the positive expectation. So positive expectations are real physical connections between neurons. And for those biologists of you out there, of course, I don't, there's still a synapse, so I don't mean a real physical connection, but I mean a real, is a, neur, a neural pathway is a real physical thing as explained in all of my work. So you cannot control the other person's response. This is what's so important and so difficult. So if I make an act of trust toward someone, I can't predict whether they will respond with an act of trust. And even if they do, it may not be today, it may be a year from now. But if I make a small act of trust to a different person every day, then a year from now, all different people will be making an act of trust toward me because their mirror, neur their mirror neurons, and their positive expectations We'll have, we'll, I'll have built bridges and we have to invest to build those bridges without expecting an immediate return. Don't wait for any one individual to reciprocate. So this is the most important thing because if I say that in order to be happy in this world, I need the support of that one person and I put all of my effort into wooing them, whether it's the person I want the promotion from or the person whose approval I want for one reason or another. And if you do that, you end up frustrated because you feel like this is your path and they are the obstacle. So they may reciprocate, but maybe in six months. So it's important to build many different bridges and still invest in small steps with that person, but don't just sit and wait for them. Keep taking small steps toward others and repetition will build a neural pathway that expects trust. And again, expectation is really a path to the on switch of your oxytocin. So you're helping yourself and the other person to turn on the oxytocin more easily in that specific circumstance. Mirror neurons will help them mirror you. So um, if you want kindness from a person and you show kindness to them, then over time, they are likely to mirror you. Small steps are enough if you keep repeating them. So the challenge is to repeat them. And this is why I enjoy watching those monkey videos where you see the monkey grooming the fur and 
they do it every day. And often the monkey grooms another monkey's fur every day for a year and doesn't get any grooming in return. But then when mating comes, mating time comes around and the monkey gets the opportunity for immortality. And that's what they're indeed investing in. And again, if you haven't read evolutionary biology, it's, it's a great subject for understanding ourselves. So you will build positive expectations about social support. Now, this is so valuable. There's nothing more valuable that you could give yourself is positive expectations about social support. Now, um, this is um, something that's hard to do if you watch the media where they're always giving you negative expectations about social support. So you could think of the media as the herd. And if you follow the herd, you're gonna get a lot of negative expectations. But all of that time that you spend watching the news, listening to the media, you could spend it building bridges with individuals instead, and then you will give yourself what you want. And I must say that these are my kids and they are now adults with their own children. Now let's uh, quickly talk about realistic expectations. This is the complication of life. We have big expectations about social support. We define social support in some grand way because when we're young, we need so much support. And when we're young is when our brain is wired. So we're wired, we wire in the expectation that the world should support me. And that's just not realistic, but nobody is out there telling you that. So I'm telling you that. So it feels like no one understands you because each brain is wired by its own unique experience. This is why nobody understands me, nobody understands you. That's just the reality of life. Nobody gets it. And now the media has created like this new crisis, like there's some huge problem because nobody understands you. Like our ancestors literally starved and had people attacking them and lived with lice all over their skin and walked hours for water. And today you have a comfortable life and you drive yourself crazy because no one understands you. This is insane, excuse me for saying, but um, I think we should be a little more um, appreciative about what we have and then say, yes, I wish people understood me, but I understand that that's not very realistic because my brain is wired from my past and their brain is wired from their past. And it gets more complicated, so let's see. In childhood, survival depends on being understood. So imagine a hunter-gatherer mother and child and there's, there, the mother puts the child down and then she can't find the child. So that child will die in the state of nature, but it can cry. And when it cries, the mother finds it and that saves its life. So our early circuits, the foundation of your brain is that other people must meet my needs or else I'm gonna cry. So when, when I'm hungry, I, a baby cannot do anything to meet its needs except to cry. So the connection between exploding with panic and fear and distress will bring what I need. And that's the first circuit. So when I try to get what I need and I'm frustrated and I can't get it, if I explode with frustration, it's just a circuit built from my past experience. It doesn't mean that something is wrong with the world. So we all wire in strong feelings about being understood that remain with us for life. Now, of course, your verbal brain doesn't think that. Your verbal brain thinks that if I'm upset, it must be a real fact that something is wrong with the world because the electricity in the brain flows like water in a storm. It finds the paths of, of least resistance. 
So the world flows into my eyes and ears and it flows into the pathways I have. That's how the brain works. So I know that people are often criticized and say, don't run on automatic, but our brain is actually designed to run on automatic. That's why our goal is to make new behaviors automatic. How can I do that with repetition? So I can build social trust in new ways with small steps, and then my electricity will flow more easily into those new oxytocin pathways. So otherwise we repeat old patterns without conscious intent. This is why we feel like we must follow the old herd because we'll, we won't get oxytocin without it. If you cling to an idealized view of human nature, then everyone you know will fall short. You always measure humans against this perfect view of they should understand me. And then you end up finding fault with everyone. Uh, so little reality check here. <laughs> Uh, you may think animals stick together, but in fact, each one pushes its way toward the center as if its life depends on it. So the bottom line is you can have group trust and social trust and individual bonds while still accepting that the other person is a mammal who is pushing to meet their own survival needs. And you are a mammal who is pushing to meet your survival needs. So it's not realistic to expect everyone to have no self-interest and to think that you have no self-interest. Uh, many people go around uh, criticizing the self-interest in others without acknowledging it in themselves. So the interesting fact, I'm gonna just uh, wrap up now, reptiles don't have oxytocin except during reproduction. This is so fascinating to me. Again, again all my books explain it. So, uh, oxytocin is what makes us mammals. If you're a reptile, you would only have it for a few seconds because that's how long reproduction lasts. Oxytocin allows mammals to form attachments, but the brain constantly weighs the survival benefits of those attachments. Mammals cooperate when the reward is mutual. And if you can accept that, then you can be more skillful in building those bridges that will allow you to feel safe and to feel safe automatically because you'll have uh, replaced those cortisol bonds of low trust with oxytocin bonds of higher trust. Our brain evolved to promote survival, not to make you feel good all the time. So when you understand it, you can take the steps you need to feel good. Our brain saves the happy chemicals for behavior that promotes survival. You seek belonging because it meets your survival needs and others seek belonging because it meets their survival needs. So we all have ups and downs shaped by old pathways, but understanding the mammal brain helps us manage it better. So more information, here's my website. And uh, here are the many free resources that you can get there. Um, these are my books. And looks like that's all. So I will stop sharing. And have I stopped sharing? And thank you for your attention. <laughs> that was fantastic, Loretta. Um, we have uh, many questions on, on, on the Academy. And I have a few as well. We, we, we have uh, six, seven more minutes. So maybe time for a couple of questions. Um, one is around loneliness. And, and you relate it very quickly to cortisol. Mm -hmm. uh, but something that we, we see today is that probably the largest pandemic that humanity is facing around the world is loneliness. How yes. can we explain loneliness from a chemical point of view? And is, is belonging um, an antidote to loneliness? Uh, yes, 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 agree with all of that. Um, a, a deeper way of looking at it would be that um, expectation that I need to be understood in order to feel safe. And it's natural and normal. Um, when the need is not met, we perceive that as a crisis because in the deeper level of our brain, it is a crisis because when you were a child, 
if your needs were not understood that it was a crisis. So the challenge is to accept that it is a real need, but it's not a real crisis. And then to say, I have the power as an adult to build social connections individually rather than wait for, for understanding to just ring my doorbell, you know? So when you're a child, it just comes to you, but we have to build it. Now, I think simply, very quickly, many children, their parents make play dates for them. And my generation, your parents didn't make play dates for you, I don't think. But we learn to expect our social bonds to be created for us. So now we are all having the new challenge of having to create them ourselves. But the good side of this is that if you and I, let's say we have a Zoom talk and you understand me in a way that other people don't understand me, then I can get this great feeling and then tomorrow I can have a Zoom talk with someone else who understands me and that relieves it. Yeah, and this is related to actually one question, and, and, and this is a personal uh, interest as well about kids and gaming, because I see, and I see my own teenagers, one of them is super happy, super happy playing games hours and hours because he's bonding with all these kids online, he's talking, but there is a common understanding of what's going on, and and that's, that's probably, is. I don't know if that's addiction and that's related to addiction, but I, but I see how happy he is because he gets understood by these other kids when they play. Yes, yes, a huge issue. Um, uh, gaming meets all of your needs. It meets your dopamine needs, your serotonin needs and your oxytocin needs, which is why it's so tempting. Um, for the oxytocin topic of today, I call it a virtual herd. So you've created a herd, but it's virtual and it's there whenever you want. You know, you can, you don't have to do anything. So the big thing for teenagers in the interest of time, I'll go right to the difficult part is rejection. Okay. If I make an overture to someone else, they might reject me. And when I'm rejected, I feel like it's a survival threat because from the animal perspective, it is a survival threat. So for a teenager, if you say to someone, do you want to do this with, you want to have coffee with me, you want to do something with me tomorrow, and they say no, then in the teen world, people laugh at each other and they ridicule each other. So a rejection is such a huge threat. And I actually, one of the first um psychology herds that I joined was Albert Ellis. And he went, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he went to Central Park and approached a hundred women and asked them for a date. And all of them said no. And he said that he didn't get a date, but he overcame his fear of rejection. So this is what teenagers need to do is to overcome their fear of rejection. And I didn't do that till I was 50 or maybe 55, you know. So if your son can do it when he's 20, that will be a great thing. Yeah, this is, and this is, this is why I feel that there is always pros and cons of having all these kids um, connecting so often through gaming because you see the pros and cons. We have yes. another, question, uh, another question about herd um, and the oxytocin benefit of the herd in this case when you follow political leaders, when you follow um, football clubs, when you follow sports, uh, can we talk about in a couple of minutes about what happens there that is so difficult to change your mind once you commit to one herd? Um, yes, well, you get your whole sense of belonging from that herd. And also that herd spends a lot of time talking about the enemy. So you think, if I leave the herd, I'm one of the enemy. I don't wanna be one of the enemy, so I better follow them. So it's a very difficult dilemma. I, I wrote about this in, in a, a different book on political correctness. But um, the other thing about uh, sports, 
politics, music, is that it's always there, just like gaming. It's so convenient. Whenever I want it, I just turn it on. And without it, you have this sudden feeling that you're an isolated mammal and our brain evolved to make us panic when we're isolated because that's how our ancestors survived by fearing isolation and sticking with the herd no matter how uncomfortable that was. So we're re really taking a big challenge in the modern world to build that sense of security with individuals rather than with groups. This is fascinating. Can we, uh, you know, Christine Neff, she, she, she talks about self, uh, self-compassion compared to self-esteem. Uh, have you explored uh, compassion and being secure of yourself through self-esteem? What is the difference from a chemical point of view between being kind to oneself or actually being strong that you are in a strong position to defend yourself? Um, so what I say in all my books is there's a lot of happy chemicals and we want all of them. So being in a strong position to defend yourself is serotonin. Uh, I know this is not the way serotonin is viewed with others, but um, I don't um, attack that feeling. I accept it as just one of the things we want that we can't have every minute. So we want the um, self-compassion is accepting that I want all of these chemicals all the time, but I'm not gonna have them all the time because that's not their job to flow effortlessly. But what I can give myself I, I, I call it neutral. So a car is either in forward or reverse or neutral. So forward is happy chemicals, reverse is cortisol, is threatened. So the point is that many people, they think if I'm not happy every minute, then I'm threatened. But neutral is in between to say, I don't have to chase something happy every minute because I'm not threatened, I'm in neutral. And neutral is freedom to say, what is my next choice? I'm going to take a minute to decide what is my next step rather than just automatically chasing something. And while I'm in neutral, I don't have to feel threatened. It is fascinating. Well, I, I think that we could be talking for hours. So I see you in Miami in a few weeks, uh, January 14th, you're gonna be around. Uh, I, I, so we have to meet there and, and we have to organize something, but today was fascinating. We got so much from this, from this uh, presentation and this uh, question and answer. I really want to thank you for all what you do and the, the, the way you really in a clear way, expose and explain how how we can uh, be in peace with our inner mama. So thank you so much, Loretta. And it's so great to, to learn from you. And thank you so much for what you do for putting this together and for putting together so many um, different perspectives on happiness that can reach such a huge number of people. I really appreciate that. Yeah, we own this together. So thank you so much, everybody. That was fascinating. So you have the recording on social networks and you have uh, this recording and more materials at the World Happiness Academy and of course, Loretta's website and the Inner Mammal Institute. So thank you so much and see you next week. Take care, bye.